So at this point, I am going to now introduce uh, Dr. Rumsey, who is with the EPA. He joined the EPA Office of Research and Development five years ago as a physical scientist and is the ORD principal investigator for developing emission estimating methodologies for air emissions from animal feeding operations. Okay, so obviously Al talked about the names, the, the measurement study. Um, and so um, we've developed different uh, emission estimating methodologies or EEMs for the different types of sources. Um, and, and so here, I'm trying to figure out which one is the, the okay. So at the moment, um, at the end, I'm gonna talk about so far we've publicly available are the EEMs uh, for poultry uh, and swine. So that's what I'm going to focus on uh, in, this, in this presentation. So you can see we all the, the various source categories. So for example, for swine sow, we developed uh, different EEMs for the gestation barn, the farrowing room, uh, and the lagoon. Uh, and so you, here you can see this makes references to, to the named sites and also the ACA site, uh, the number of barns or lagoons. So this is all, all the names information. Uh, and they, these are the EEMs with, uh, so far on uh, ammonia, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and the three different sizes uh, of particulate matter. And so this is the number. So uh, we've developed 20 EEMs for poultry uh, and 29 uh, for the swine. And so, um, and also we've developed uh, a couple of additional submodels to differentiate between uh, shallow and deep pit for the gestation. Uh, uh, barn at the swine sow and for the barns at the swine grow finish. So I'll say I'm, the, the, the same methodology was used for all of these different EEMs. So I'm going to go give you a, an overview of that process. Uh, start off by giving, going through the process of the variable selection, then talk about the statistical approach for uh, developing the EEMs for daily emissions, for estimating daily emissions. Uh, then we'll talk about the evaluation of these of the various models uh, in terms of performance and the model coefficient consistency. And then uh, talk about the application of the dairy emission model uh, and additional model testing. And then talk about how uh, annual emissions and the corresponding uh, associated uncertainty. So we started off uh, with a literature review, um, you know, looking at identifying the factors that we know have an established relationship with emissions. Um, and so that was the first important step. Uh, and then we identified those factors were identified and we selected them for further investigation, starting off uh, with some kind of exploratory data analysis. Uh, and so I've, what I've done here is I've summarized, obviously not all of these factors apply um, you know, to each of the EEMs. Some of these only would pertain to barn EEMs. Uh, some of these would only be open source lagoon or basin. Uh, and then some of these, for example, litter status, right? That would just apply uh, to broiler. So this is just kind of uh, all of the various factors that were in the, uh, the, the swine and poultry EMs. So these were, as Al was talking about, uh, these were uh, measure recorded, uh, continuous or daily, uh, these factors. Although the, um, the biomaterial was done less frequently, obviously you're collecting, manually collecting samples, and that was done sort of on a monthly uh, to quarterly basis. So that was uh, less, less frequent data for that. So this is the kind of exploratory data analysis that we did. So we would look um, at trends, uh, look at patterns of the, of the emissions and the, the production and the environmental variables. We look at them by site. Uh, we look at them by monitored units. So obviously we would do, you know, summary statistics, uh, but also look at like the time series. So this is just an example here. This is the uh, ammonia emissions on the y-axis. This is the two years of names data uh, at, at Oklahoma, the swine sow um, site. And so here, you know, what you can obviously see here is you have that nice seasonal pattern, right? You can see higher emissions uh, in the summer, uh, here lower emissions during the winter. So this is, you know, kind of thing you might, uh, you can observe when you, you look at these time series. You can also see when there's differences between uh, barns. Um, so this is, this is two different uh, time series for the barn one and barn two. Um, we also looked at scatter plots and regression analysis just to kind of 
get an idea about the potential strength of relationship uh, between variables and emissions. So uh, here you can see the corresponding uh, relationship between uh, ammonia emissions and the ambient temperature. So we would do the exploratory data analysis, the literature, uh, and then we would select variables that we would include in our models. Uh, we would also consider the data quantity, how much data we had, and also the potential, whether this variable, uh, the potential age that this variable uh, could be measured by a, a producer. So for each of those uh, EEM source and pollutant categories, uh, approximately six to 30 different models with different combinations uh, of those variables um, were developed for consideration. And, and just as a note here that these models uh, were developed for the whole production cycle uh, and times when the barns, including times when the, the barns houses uh, were empty. So that the type of model that was used, the statistical approach, what is known as a linear mixed effects model. Um, the reason that this was chosen is because this allows, uh, takes into account the correlation uh, between successive measurements. Uh, and so this was accounted for uh, using a repeated variance uh, spatial power covariance structure. Uh, and the reason why this particular covariance structure was used in the statistical model was because it could uh, deal with uh, uneven or different time intervals or spacings in the data, right? So when we have this two years of data, there might be some gaps. We don't have measurements necessarily every day or valid measurements every day. And so that could be a gap of one day or it could be 10 days. And so this allows, this uh, statistical covariance structure allows to, to deal with that. Uh, so this is the form of the equation. We, uh, the predictive variables uh, were regressed against, we did a natural log transformation uh, on uh, the emissions. Uh, and here you can see where uh, we got the coefficients here, the betas uh, for the predictive variables uh, or the parameters. So this uh, model equation was predicting uh, natural log uh, emissions. And so that has to be back transformed. And when you back transform that, um, you also have to have uh, an adjustment for bias associated with the log transformation. Uh, and also, uh, we also would subtract a constant. So when you do a log transformation, you have to have positive emissions. And so as I was talking about negative concentrations and negative emissions, some for our log transformation, we would have to uh, add some numbers sometimes. So we would re-subtract that back. So we would have all of these, these various models uh, with the different predictive variables. Uh, and so we would evaluate them. Uh, we, the model fit statistics were, were calculated. The, the twice the, the log likelihood and the var various uh, variations of that were calculated. Um, but then we also wanted to look at the, the performance when the, the emissions were back transformed. Uh, and so uh, we looked at you know, the, air, the, the bias between, uh, the, so this why this is the back transformed predicted emissions, uh, why O would be the uh, observed emissions. So we looked at, uh, in terms of the performance of the model, the bias and also the error, uh, which is the absolute difference uh, between the measured uh, and the predicted emissions. Uh, and so we also normalized those. This was just a, a useful way to compare uh, performance amongst different EMs by looking at the error as, and bias as percentages. So we also, you know, we, we calculated this for each of our, each of our models. And, and then we also looked at these, these fit plots here. So this, what you're seeing here is this is uh, measured um, uh, ammonia emissions on the, uh, on the x-axis, and then we have our model predicted on the y. And so obviously, you know, when you have higher measured uh, emissions, you, you'd hope your model is going to have predict higher emissions as well. So this is something else that we would look at. So this is the one-to-one -one line here. So obviously, if we had a perfect model, every single one of these uh, would, would be on that line. So this is the, the example, this is the, the swine uh, growth finish uh, shallow uh, pit model, I should say. Um, so we had all those models and we looked at the, the model performance and we also again considered the potential ease of use in terms of how easily uh, a farmer could obtain uh, measurements of those predicted uh, values. 
So here's just an example, just to kind of go through. This is go through and show you an example uh, application of a selective model. This is for swine growth finish uh, ammonia uh, for the shallow pit. Uh, and so we have our intercept value here. Uh, we have positive coefficients uh, for ambient temperature and live animal weight. Uh, and so I just kind of got an example calculation here, right? So this is a it predicts daily emissions. So if the average daily temperature was 15 degrees Celsius and you had uh, 600 pigs with an average weight of 50 kilograms, there's your total live animal weight. And you would substitute, there's the 15. Uh, live animal weight is in megagrams or 1,000 kilograms. So the input unit is 30. So you've got your back transformed, uh, so not your, your natural log emissions there. And then you back transform it. And, and so that would be your predicted emissions for one barn. Um, and so this model, uh, since the measurements were made from, from, from barns, so the model predicts for one barn. And so you would have to apply this model um, to each barn uh, on a farm. So we also evaluated the, the model coefficient consistency. So we have, um, we are developing these models based on the names data. So this, um, and so what this is called a jackknife, this uh, statistical method. And so this examines the cumulative effect of multiple minus one runs on coefficient estimates. So this is done by removing one sample unit, uh, the barn or the lagoon per run, and determining the associated parameter estimates and performance statistics. Uh, and so this compares the value of the coefficients, model fit and performance statistics back to the full model and other jackknife runs. And so this, this figure here kind of shows, so what we're, what we're doing here is that this is our, our regular uh, model of what we call a full model. And this was the, so this was the ambient temperature coefficient uh, developed on the full model, meaning that none of the sample units had been removed. So we then re-ran or redeveloped the model with one of the, the barns removed. And we see how consistent the model was in terms of its temperature coefficient. And so you can see here in this particular example that when we remove, so instead of developing on four barns, we developed the model on three barns, how much did the, the ambient temperature coefficient change? So in this particular case, uh, it was quite consistent uh, the, the influence of the temperature. Um, so what we have here, this is the, the full model with the, the standard error. And so we were, models with consistent coefficients uh, have these jackknife coefficients all within the standard error, this gray shaded here of the full model. So additional model testing that we did, uh, we did a sensitivity analysis. Uh, this allows an analysis of the limitations of the model and whether the model could produce unreasonable uh, results such as uh, you know, negative emission values, uh, higher or low emissions in certain conditions, uh, or a rapid changes in emissions. So I'm just going to, again, go through an example. This is for the broiler house ammonia. Uh, and so what we would do is we would take our model. So let's look at this ambient temperature example. So, example. so we would use the average value for relative humidity and live animal weight, we plug that into the model, and then we would vary the ambient temperature from the, the limits of the observational data uh, from negative nine Celsius to 31. And so what this is showing is showing what the model predicted emissions were as temperature increased uh, from uh, minus nine to 30. Uh, and so we also did the same here, varying live animal weight and keeping temperature and relative humidity constant and uh, also with uh, relative humidity varying that while keeping uh, the temperature and the live animal weight constant. We also uh, tested uh, the models uh, on independent data sets where possible, uh, where we had, um, you know, where we had a good independent data set to test it out on. Um, we compared the models to uh, emission factors uh, in literature. And we also uh, demonstrated uh, application of the model uh, using uh, practical examples. So we our models were developed to uh, estimate daily emissions. And so uh, in order to get a annual emission, you would just use that model 
for each day of the year and sum them up. And therefore, you would have your annual emission. Um, but we also wanted to characterize the uncertainty uh, associated with that annual emission. And uh, this was, we did this by characterizing the random error in the model prediction using a uh, Monte Carlo analysis. Uh, and so what this is, is that basically we took the residuals on the, norm, on the back transform normal scale, which is the, uh, the difference uh, in comparison to the measured emissions. And then we randomly selected those residuals and added them to a predicted emissions uh, for each day of the year. So these predicted emissions were generated using an example meteorological profile, uh, while the other predictive variables remain constant. And so we did this, uh, we predicted it for each day of the year, uh, adding these randomly selected residuals, and they were summed to produce an annual single source total emissions. And then this was done 10,000 times. Um, and so you've got, you've got these, the statistics of these replicated uh, annual emissions are calculated. Uh, and so we did these 10,000 simulations for each one of these different uh, emission intervals uh, by varying one of the predictive variables. So I'll, I'll just kind of go for an example. And, and so this is for, uh, for the example is the swine barn growth finish ammonia. So we did 45 sets of 10,000 simulations to, uh, by varying the live animal weight uh, in regular intervals of 3,000 from zero to 132,000 uh, and kept the meteorological profile the same. So for each, we, we had these 45 intervals uh, and these this example here uh, that we would calculate it the interval uncertainty by looking at those 10,000 simulations, looking at the difference between the 2.5, the range between the 2.5 and the, the 97.5 percentile. Uh, and then we, we plotted them here. Uh, and this was the interval uncertainty. And this relationship takes the form of uh, Y equals K over X, where K is a constant. And so from this, there were, uh, we would determine the constant, and then we could calculate the percent uncertainty. Uh, and then using that percent uncertainty, we could calculate the absolute or resulting uncertainty uh, for a lagoon or barn. So where the, uh, the annual emission uncertainty uh, would be the annual emissions multiplied by the percent uncertainty uh, divided by 100. So that is just the, uh, the uncertainty for, you know, for one particular unit, uh, a lagoon or a barn. And so to add up to, the, to calculate the annual emission uncertainty for all of the sources, uh, we use like an error propagation equation by uh, squaring each of the uncertainties, uh, oh, sorry, and then adding them up and taking the square root. So we would have a total farm uncertainty, which would represent uh, the number of barns or, or open source lagoons. Uh, on a farm. So that, that's kind of a, a process overview of what we, what we did for all of these different uh, emission estimating methodologies. And so I've kind of, this presentation, we've kind of gone through the development, evaluation, application, and testing of the daily emission models, and also focused on estimating uh, annual emissions and associated uncertainty. So the reports, uh, the uh, results of the, um, can be found in these reports that are available uh, online. This is the web, the web address here, the web link. And as I said, draft uh, swine and poultry EEMs have been developed and I've used examples in this presentation. 